So this is, this is a dream come true for me, to have Professor Harish Trivedi in our midst to talk about translation. It doesn't get any better than that. And he has had to give up his invitation to the royal wedding to be here, <laughs> <laughs> quite apart from crossing the seven seas. So this is um, a wonderful opportunity. But you're going to kiss him on the balcony, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Just like yesterday. <laughs> Never miss an opportunity. Um, I have, from this point on, very little idea about how we're going to do this. But I'm hoping that uh, a number of people here have, um, at the very least, thought about these, trans these uh, texts. Some, I know, have, uh, have, have written elegant translations, which I have some of them in front of me here. Um, oh no, that's not elegant, that's mine. I'll put that aside. Um, and have you got another one to add to this pile? Well, we have to give it to you. <laughs> not necessarily, not necessarily. Let's see, let's see what we're going to do. Let's see what we're going to do. What, what's the best way of, of taking? We're going to, we've got three texts to look at. We've got the Premchan, we've got the Tulsi Das, and we have got the mystery, uh, whatever it is at the end. Um, you know, I thought, I thought what we could do is, you know, I don't know, everywhere is done differently. And I don't know what Rupert had in mind. But the first ground rule that I made was that I don't have to do anything. <laughs> I mean, teachers don't work in India. I don't know what kind of a teacher he is here doing the same work as all the students. <laughs> Doesn't follow. <laughs> so, so he has done his version. What I decided to do after overhearing some of you yesterday you. was that many people thought that the Hindi, that the Premchand passage was a bit more accessible and a bit more fun to do while everybody who claims to know Hindi, except Rupert, uh, fainted at the sight of the Tulsi Das. <laughs> I fainted, but I did it in private. Does anyone need a copy of this text? There are only two persons who can ever in the world who figured out what this uh, verse I from Kavitavali means, and one was Tulsi Das, and the <laughs> other is Rupert. <laughs> we'll follow him. Because I can assure you that F.R. Olchin whose translation we are using was not quite there. Even I know this much. He did a good job, but you know, I think he made some howlers. And Rupert will then arbitrate between <laughs> whether I think I'm making howlers and pointing out his howlers, or whether they are his howlers. Uh, I will focus mainly, therefore, on the second and the third about the first passage is very enjoyable, but you know, I, I, it struck me very late. Rupert had circulated this a long time back. In fact, you know, the, my experience of doing this is in my MPhil classes uh, in literary translation theory and practice at the University of Delhi. And some of what we put together, some of the ideas that we put together, uh, Susan Bassnett and I, in that volume called uh, Postcolonial Post Translation theory and practice, uh, which came out about 10 years back, if not 12. Uh, I do work in translation studies, but the fun part is not the theory, judging by what my students tell me every year. It is the second half of my classes each week when we actually take up a translation, perhaps in two versions, as here, as in the case of the Premchand. And it's wonderful that Rupert could get you. I mean, there is the Western work ethic, actually, to produce your own versions, <laughs> all of you. <laughs> In India, we're quite happy if there are two published translations before <laughs> us, <laughs> so that we don't do that work. And then we get to work on it, because we really enjoy tearing into these things. That's much simpler and sweeter. <laughs> and what you can do is, those of you who think that they have, another thing that our students find out very quickly is, in publication, in published translations of Indian works from any language, Hindi and so on, it's not at all difficult to improve on the published translation. They can't believe it. My students can't believe it. Students nowhere can believe it. Print is supposed to be sacrosanct, but it's not. It's so easy to improve on it. I'm not saying that these translations are bad. One of them is by a long-time colleague of mine at the University of Delhi, the newer translation, the Penguin translation, Manju Jain. Of course, I don't know. I mean, there is cultural essentialism, but why not? In these cases, it's much more fun when one of the translators is Western and the <laughs> other is Indian. 
<laughs> Much more fun. What do you do with Western Indians? <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you might want to qualify into one of the categories. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's even more interesting. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because then one can't even make out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to disprove all my theories. <laughs> now, translating it oneself at home is one kind of thing. But sitting together and looking at the translations, I think the first thing to the most enjoyable part of this for everyone, human nature being what it is, to pick out all the howlers in the published translations. This gives infinite delight to everyone who has not actually done the translations. So that's one thing that everyone enjoys doing. One other rule that I have gradually enforced in the sessions that I sometimes run in, I mean always each week run in those courses, is it's again natural human tendency you can point out the howlers, but you should not laugh. You're not entitled to laugh because the right to laugh you can earn only by suggesting a better alternative. You can laugh them to your heart's content, but one has to earn the right. Pointing out an error is the first thing. If you think it's an error, and if it's an error in a published trans, published by Oxford, published by Penguin, uh, it's a sense of achievement in itself. But then the better thing is to go and uh, see how it can be done better. And collectively is much more fun, both pointing out howlers and trying to improve on it. So uh, translation, unlike writing poetry or novels, should be always a collective activity. That's what I believe. There's no romantic myth attaching to the one original creator in the case of translation. Uh, as I said, what, I'll, what I hope to have a bit more fun with, uh, especially, and afford fun to Rupert at least, if not to many others at my expense, is when we come to Tulsidas. And the last one will have a different kind of exercise. It's the question I've been asking at the level of translation theory for a long time. I don't know the answer. I don't even know which way to go for an answer. We'll come to that. Meanwhile, for Premchand, let me begin with just two considerations. After that, it's over to you to point out everything that you wish to. One, I don't trust the original. In this case, I, that's putting it politely, I totally distrust the original. I'm sorry it struck me so late that uh, I could not really ask uh, Rupert properly to organize uh, evidence for my distrust. <laughs> Shahar Amiron ke rehne aur kray vikray ka sthan hai. This sentence is bad Hindi. Yeah. <laughs> why is it bad Hindi? Because Premchand wrote it. <laughs> and why, is it, why does Premchand write it? Because he did not write it. My suspicion is he did not write the sentence. My suspicion is he did not write most of this first page. Uh, I'm sorry I've got into this lecturing mode, but please bear with me for two or three minutes as to why I say this. I don't, I don't have any evidence. The evidence would have been if I had told Rupert earlier to produce the evidence for my arguments. <laughs> but it's not come yet. It's not, not his fault. Premchand began writing and publishing fiction in about 1901, 1902. For the next 14 or 15 years, he published five novels and about 85 short stories exclusively in Urdu. Why did he write in Urdu? Because, I'm sorry, you know, there'll be so many totally politically incorrect essentialist statements that I'll make. Because he was a Kayast. It was more than likely for an educated Kayast to write in Urdu at that point in time. <coughs> So he began like that, and he was brought up in the Urdu literary tradition, Talis Bahoshruba uh, and things like that. He describes that very vividly in his uh, uh, autobiographical piece, which then Amrit Rai, his son, builds on in the prize-winning biography, uh, Kalam Kasi Pahi. Beginning around 1915-16, he begins to switch to Hindi. It cannot happen overnight. He doesn't know Hindi the greatest novelist in Hindi. At that age, he was born in 1880, <laughs> does not know Hindi. And he begins to learn Hindi. 
and in the first publications are stories already published in Urdu, which he now begins to translate into Hindi and to send for publication into Hindi, where he's welcomed with quite amazing alacrity. He's already made a reputation in Urdu, and the Hindi Balas are very pleased that he is now beginning to be published in. Uh, uh, how does it? Devi Saraswati ke mandir mein hum ullas ke saath unka swagat karte. Something like that. Yeah. It's not communal. I don't think. It's only interlingual. And the interlingual tribal. I mean, Premchand is a Hindu, for God's sake. Nanpatraya Srivastav. That's his name. <coughs> the important moment is what some historians have called the McDonald moment, 1900, when Hindi gets a foot in the door of British bureaucracy. And it totally swamps Urdu within 10 years, certainly within 20 years, as soon as it gets a foot in the door. That's all. As an alternative, Devanagari being accepted as an alternative to the Urdu, the Peshu Arabic script. Just that. No mention of language in, the, in McDonald's order in 1900. It should be called, I feel, the Malvia moment. <laughs> well, Malvia was the great petitioner for that. It's not the person who grants, it's the person who organizes the campaign for 20 years yeah. who should be memorialized in that moment. They both begin with M anyhow, so no, it's not too much bother. <laughs> yeah. So, Premchand is now feeling the consequences of the McDonald moment. Urdu is being swamped by, swamp, by swamp, what do I mean? Nobody is doing it deliberately. It's not part of social engineering. It is the demographics of the Hindi-speaking area, what is now called belt, asserting itself democratically. Urdu was propped up artificially by the British policy, begun in 1837, as being the only official language or script permissible in administration. Now it's been equalized with Devanagari script. Suddenly, the number of books published in Hindi uh, outsold those in Urdu number of newspapers, circulation of newspapers. These are British government figures. So many people have cited them. These are the facts. Premchand this feeling on his pulse, this tremendous social cultural change. And that's the one reason, the one big reason why he is switching now to Hindi gradually. The last big novel that he writes in Urdu as devoted to Urdu is bazar e -Husn. He has already a reputation as the most famous novelist in Urdu, and yet he cannot find a publisher. That's how bad it is. bazar e -Husn lies around, uh, Snehal knows all about that, unpublished for some time, and then he has it, he does it himself or has it done into Hindi. It's very unclear at this stage. This is five or six years after he has actually begun publishing his short stories in Hindi. And, you know, I went into it a little bit. I wrote an article in the 1980s on this. Bazari Husn becomes in Hindi Seva Sada. <laughs> what kind of transformation is that? I mean, it's mind boggling. It's as if two totally alien cultures were entering some kind of a strange transaction. It's the same novel, <laughs> but it becomes Seva Sata. There are three extra chapters. Sir? There are three extra chapters. Yeah, 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 right. I mean, it's not the same novel, but it's pretty much, it can pass for the same novel for the ignorant. <laughs> so, <coughs> actually, he has translated the Hindi version, the Hindi version, and the Urdu version, bazar e has been translated by a translator in Pakistan, published from Karachi by the Oxford University Press. That'll be a fascinating study. I do not know whether these two translators have actually adopted two different versions of Rangabhumi, the Urdu and the Hindi, or not. Rangabhumi is the Hindi version, the Hindi title. Chogane Hasti, is the Urdu. Again, when, when will the twain meet? <laughs> I mean, there's such a huge cultural gap, the gap in connotation. Chogane Hasti then becomes more like playground, which is the title of one of the, these translations. 
Rangabhumi is more theatrical, more performative. That's a game. Polo, Chogane Hasti, the polo of life. So that's the background. We do not have enough biographical information compiled even by his son, the prize-winning biographer, to know whether this sentence was actually came off Premchand's own pen. It would sound linguistically far more consistent and persuasive to me if it were Shahar Amiron ke rehne aur Kharid Farukht ki jagah hai. That would be a natural sentence. So what are they translating? What are they translating? And are we translating a fairly a hybridized, uneven translation to start with? After these most encouraging remarks, I'll stop. <laughs> and I want all of you. So to should we all go now? <laughs> <laughs> At every step, I find some of that. Whenever Premchand gets very tatsam, I have a suspicion at this stage of his life that he didn't know what he was writing or somebody else wrote it for him. Premchand becomes a very convincing Hindi writer only after Kayakalp and maybe beginning with Nirmala. I, well, now that I remember it, I was trying to suppress this memory. Why does Premchand move to uh, Hindi? One reason I've given, that's the one I believe in. There's another reason that I don't want to believe. It's so uncomfortable. But I've read it, it's totally authentic, from his own pen, and therefore I'll mention it. He writes to his best friend, Diana Randigam, Urdu writer, editor of Zamana, very influential Urdu literary figure, his bosom friend. Premchand writes, I think it's 1916 or 17, he says, Ab hindi mein bhi ki ka I'm beginning to practice <laughs> to write in Hindi as well. Urdu mein likke kis Hindu ko faiz hua hai jo mujhe hoga. Which Hindu has ever flourished by writing in Urdu that I will. Make what you like of this statement. It is utterly authentic. Its veracity cannot be doubted. Its context cannot be doubted. Its date cannot be doubted. Premchand's biographer, very enlightened, <coughs> <coughs> Marxist, secular, <coughs> intellectual, and creative right. I'm choking over the sentence already. <laughs> Amrit Rai, after quoting this, it's not only in Chitti Patri, Amrit Rai quotes this. After quoting this, what his comment, Amrit Rai's comment? Munshi ji ko, ka, Munshi ji meaning Premchand. He refers to his father, Premchand, always as Munshi ji in that biography. Munshi ji ko kahe ki thes lag gai ki unko aisi baat likhni padi. That's a rhetorical question. I mean, what, what cut to the quick in his heart that he came out with a sentence like this? But he doesn't offer, beyond this rhetorical question, he doesn't offer an explanation. So that's the other factor. Uh, a story like Kafan, for example, or even a story like Shatranj ke Khiladi, I would want to believe that there, the linguistic integrity of both the texts is more to be relied on than in this case. It's evolving all the time, his linguistic competence. And Godan, the last novel, is actually a Hindi novel, beyond doubt, which was translated into Urdu after Premchand's death. And again, the title is utterly significant. You may not even notice the difference in the title, but it's a huge cultural difference hiding in that very subtle difference. Gaudan. Gaudan and Gaudan. Ab aap hi kuch bolie. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, yeah. you've talked about Hindi and Urdu. Gaudan, the, I've seen the, his notebooks for the sketching of that narrative, and it was done in English. No, no, that's a different thing. I'll tell you something about that. I'll tell you something about that. One thing, a great pressure, a upasak, he worshipped him as a novelist. He came to see him. And he found Premchan doing this for Kayakal, much earlier than his life, for Kayakal, putting down you know, notes on characters, plot, etc. in English. And he was horrified, this worshipper of Premchan. He said, Premchand ji, what are you doing? You're the greatest, he said that in Hindi, you're the greatest novelist in Hindi and you are making notes in English. 
वाई सो प्रेमचंद सेल क्योंकि मैं भी बी ए पास हूँ So can you direct us in our operation of how do we do this? Are we going to look at sentence by sentence? Are you going to bring up points and see how we've all done? How do we do this? Other people perhaps have better, a good idea. You know what? Do so you have some of our translations? So I have some here. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, I think I think uh, we could ask people to offer to make comments on whatever they thought was <coughs> problematic or different or difficult uh, between the two translations and the original, if it's the original, uh, and uh, thus to Is go, if thing? not sentence by sentence, and at least, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, point by point, difficult point by point, crux by crux. Mm. That's, uh, Okay, so um, let's get cracking. Let's uh, this imaginary Hindi, not Hindi novel. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this has all made it easier or more difficult to do. Um, what I what I was very amused by is the very. F I mean, what is the most fundamental difference between Hindi and English? It's that uh, Hindi doesn't have a, a definite or indefinite article, and the the first word of the novel is Sheher. And one translator says a city, and the other says the city. So we get right into it from the very outset. Yeah? Sure, what an absurd language English. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many, can we just find out how many people said A and how many people said B? Yeah, that's right. A? a. I can't remember. No. I'll go for A. Yeah? I, I, said, uh, I, I said B. Yeah. I, said, I did something different. Yeah? I did cities, and then I added a colon later. Were you dodging it? Did well, it I, just, I just thought it was a better way of dealing with the Korean Cities, yeah, that's yeah, right. right? Cities, that's a kind of generic thing. Yeah, cities ah. are the abodes of the rich, where the rich live and busy themselves, right? So, I have one other suggestion here. Is Amir the rich? Everybody says the rich. The respect. Could it be the affluent? Yeah. Mm. Not everybody who, sits in the, who lives in the city is rich. But the contrast is with poverty mm -hmm. elsewhere. But just a suggestion. It's not better. I know it's not better. But there's another way of looking at Amir. What if here you use the word Rahis? Hmm? Here you use the word Rahis. Shahir Rahis. 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 Yeah. Then would you suggest rich or affluent? Maybe Urdu says Rahis and Hindi says Amir. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I should not be, I should not be sabotaging this entirety. <laughs> But, uh, yeah. And, you know, Krai Vikrai, how does that go in translations? Because the two translators are, again, different. Conduct their business and uh, live in trade. <coughs> Busy themselves? Hmm? They said go about their business. I said the city is where the rich live, where they, where they ply their trade. Yeah. You know, I have... It's, all the suggestions I have will not read well, but that's my job, to introduce another factor, which is, why don't you say buy and sell? Mm. Buy and sell makes it very commercialized. Mm -hmm. It makes it almost cynical, right from the word go. But it is part of how the novel unfolds, mm -hmm. it's part of the cynical view, this extremely interrogative view that Premchan takes of the rich, and what is involved, what do they buy and sell? In the very next sentence, Shahar ki bahar ki zameen, bahar ki bhoomi. How does the plot unfold? People living in the city want to buy up the land where Surdas is in order to set up a cigarette factory there. That's how the novel goes. So to buy and sell signals that right from the start. Trade could be anything. Trade is almost fair trade. <laughs> so, yeah. It doesn't sound good, I agree. I had put buy and sell, and huh. then and then when I finished the whole thing, I found that the register was too yeah, mundane. Yeah, yeah. And right. then I thought that I needed to go back and make it sound sort of one step closer to Dickens or something. You know, something slightly, like, yeah, you know. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, leaving aside the, your 
introductory remarks about this not being Graham Chan's word anyway. I mean, Gray, the Gray is, is high register. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah? Sure. And if one wants to preserve that, then buying and selling doesn't seem yeah. to do it. But you make it but better if, and different But points. if it was at all Kharid Farooq, mm -hmm. then perhaps that would be more plausible, buy and sell. But don't you think that oftentimes when we do that and we're doing Kharid or Farooq, yeah. when we do that, where like the, the whole compound is one idea that's, right. that's sort of signifying uh, <clears throat> more than the sum of its parts. So for example, in Urdu we have words like Abu Haba, Kharido Farooq. Yeah. And the, sure. like, Abu Haba is not just water and air, it's the whole environment. Kharido Farooq is not just sort of buying and selling, it's that whole kind of economic marketplace that we're talking about. And so that it gives you that sort of one and one equals three sense. And I think in a translation, if we're going to going to use, if we're going to be literal, we're going to lose some of that force when we bring that across into English. I agree. Perhaps, you know, in suggesting what I did, I'm jumping the gun yeah. to about three chapters into the plot. Yeah. What did you do now? Uh, well, I hadn't, I mean, I just said business because I hadn't heard this word before. Mm. And so, Cray, it, Cray. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. know what it means, but I've never heard it used. And so I, it, it was it kind of, it was, it was cold and I didn't know what to do. question you raised brings us right to the heart of the matter of translation, which is how literal do you want to be, and how much do you want to strike a tone? Yeah. And, and, you, and you, one can't necessarily assume that you can reproduce the same tone in the target language that has been established by the language you use in the, in the source language. So. What I was finding was that the tone is something which is, which you can only really tell when you've got quite a lot done, and you read the over. Yes. It's the overall tone of it, and so you, you can struggle away with individual words and phrases right. in terms of equivalences and so forth, and closeness and faithfulness and all that. But then you it may end up with something which just ends up sounding very dis very different from what you wanted it to sound like. That's why, so I don't know who else did this. I was hedging my bets throughout. I haven't read the novel in Hindi, and I, I was just trying to choose uh, expressions which allowed me to later go back and decide if I could make different um, choices, lexical choices to get, yeah, to reinforce what I wanted to. What did you have down here? Conduct their business. Yeah. But it's also true that I didn't know the expression before. I wonder, you know, this makes me wonder, how often have we come, Kharidu Farooq is fine. That's an idiomatic Urdu phrase. How idiomatic is Kray Bikray in Hindi? Hardly. Not so Not much, It's a shadow phrase mm -hmm. from Hutu. That's the problem with Prem Chan, right? That so much of his work was translated to Hindi from Urdu. You know, first we should have a text, or at least we should have two, two distinct texts. We should know what is what. But, you know, in the, in the case, sometimes, you know, I don't know where to hide our collective head in India, in terms of Hindi Urdu scholarship. Nobody has even attempted to do this, except in two little selections of short stories, uh, brought out some of them as short, the same short stories, with facing page Hindi Urdu texts both in Devanagari. Uh, but for that, nobody has even attempted to do that with these novels. I compared a very short passage in that article that I wrote in 1884 or something. 1884? So, uh, 1784. <laughs> 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 I mean, I anticipated by a few years. <laughs> in his published in the Jadapur Journal of Comparative Literature, when I compared one paragraph each from the Urdu version and the Hindi version. Of this novel? Of this, uh, not, not this, Seva Sardin and Baldari. Okay. Yeah. No, I've, done, I've done this in, uh, uh, I've done Shatranj Ke Kiladi in uh, the Sheldon Pollock volume, similarly, to show the difference between Hindi and Urdu, not regarding Prem Chand. But this, Amrit Rai was trying to do it systematically right towards the end of the expiry of the copyright for whatever reasons and motives. 
<coughs> but it didn't go very far. Khair, aage badhe mera kya likh rahe hain? Has anyone got any further comments on that before we move on from the? Because my next problem was to imagine. Um, well, yeah. Sorry, just to jump in on. I know we won't progress very far if you just go to the second no, no. sentence. Yeah. But it seems to me to take up on Max's point that we have in Hindi a feature of language and words being combined, which means something other or have a, a sort of different valence than they would in English. And in the second sentence, we have you know the city is a place for, or the place outside the city is a place for their diversion and pleasure. And the original words are Manobranjan and Vino. And in English, <coughs> diversion and pleasure are perhaps not super different. And the, the valences of these words are very overlapping. And it seems to me in general in Hindi, we'll use two words in the place of just a single English word. And how do we, if this is, is probably not the only instance of that kind of language mm -hmm. use in this novel, how would we approach that without making it sound redundant in English? So should we go around and see what we've got for this, uh, how people have dealt with this? This is a very nice point about these two words. I had the, the different problem, which was just with the city's geography. Yeah. And what yeah. they call the Shahir ki Bahar ki I had that. Which, yeah. Yeah. Do we go straight for country, or do we go for yeah. Yeah. empty yeah. location? Yeah. And then the so, Uska Madhya Bhag, is that the center yeah. of the city, or the space between the country? I had that terrible, <laughs> I was losing sleep over this. Madhya Bhag, right? Whether it was kind of middle distance. Right, kind of and then yeah. Shahir ki Aspas huh. ki Basti, are they on all sides, on some of the sides? I don't have a map of Banaras to look at, so I just sort of imagine the place and then I work backwards to the vocabulary that I would use to right. identify the classes in each of the zones, right? So I thought cities are the place of the idle rich, so instead of business I actually went to occupy themselves or flit away their time as opposed to the mm -hmm. transaction. Um, country is where you come alive and play as opposed to diversion and pleasure. The, the central part of the city is where nothing happens, right? Students don't go to school and these lawsuits happen, right? And the sort of flanked around or the places of poverty. That's how I, but with just mapping out the geography of what he imagines Benares to look like at this point was the difficult part for me. What, well, what did you do with Shehr Ki Bahar Ki Bumi? Well, but should we have the, some sentences now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I had, it's outer districts are places for their entertainment and delight. At its center are schools for their progeny and air arenas for their legal tussles wherein the poor are choked half to death in the name of justice. Sure. The area outside is a place for their amusement and pleasure. In its middle section are the children's schools and the uh, arena for their litigation, where in the name of justice the poor are suffocated. I went country, so. <laughs> <laughs> the country, though, is where they come alive and play. In the central part of the city are the schools that their children attend, and the wrestling pits where the overly litigious settle their skirmishes where justice is the alibi used to strangle the necks of the poor. The land beyond is a place for their pleasure and entertainment. The place between is a realm of their children's schools and their lawyers' offices where the torrents of justice are crammed on the throats of the poor. It strikes me that district makes it seem like a different kind of outside the city and a different kind of pleasure. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how mm -hmm. my imagination of pleasure would work. <laughs> Outside its precinct lies the place for their entertainment and pleasure. The heart of the city has schools for their sons and their arenas for litigation where on the pretext of justice the poor are followed. Oh, so let me just pass that. The area outside the city, I've also said on the outskirts of the city, serves as a place for their entertainment and festivities. The middle of the city or the center of the city contains schools for the boys of the rich people and their courts where the poor are strangled in the name of administering justice. Uh, back there? Yep. No, no, you, you, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the area outside it? their place of recreation and leisure. In its middle lie its boys' schools and its arenas for playing around with legal cases where the poor are strangled under the pretense of law. Anybody over there? 
You're on, Carla. Well, I, didn't, I wasn't very happy with mine. <laughs> you probably didn't guess it. Outside it is the arena for their entertainments and amusements. In its center, but I also said slash heart because I wasn't sure which way I was going with it. Are the schools of their sons, uh, and the, the, I wanted to say arena, but I said rinks. For those whose hobby it is to contest lawsuits, mm -hmm. where under the pretext of law, the poor are strangled. Any more? Arbitrate. Huh, my, my arbitrate thing. What I'll do is, I'll chicken out of this. I haven't, I haven't done this passage. You know, as I said, uh, there's a virtuous excuse for it. I've done the next one. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know. I don't know how you're doing for time. What I would like to do at this stage is, I mean, you know, my infill classes were scheduled for two hours. They went on for five or six. But here we don't have that liberty. Here everybody is so busy. They have something else to go to at the end of this. What I will do regarding this first passage is just point out one or two things which I noticed, which I thought were problematic. Mm -hmm. Not only in the two translations, but also for myself in understanding Hindi or in appreciating Hindi. And perhaps uh, everyone can contribute to this pool or what looks difficult or problematic or where there's an issue involved. Because at this rate, we'll still be here, you know, till mm -hmm. the cows come home. Na shahe wahan ne shahri dibgun ki jodi pahunchti hai. I thought there's an obvious phrase, city lights. Yeah. But neither translator has used it. <laughs> neither published translator. And the repetition of shahri three times. Right. That's the kind of castigation. So one has to stick to this. Shahri chhidkao ke shite. There is a kind of municipal practice when a water truck used to go on the main roads of a city to settle, to help the dust settle down, so that in the evening people could come out for a walk. This cultural reference is not immediately obvious now. And the third thing, Shahri Jal Sotunga Pravah. Jal Sotunga Pravah Premchand could not write at this stage. <laughs> and these are, these are the little bits of evidence I have for my suspicion. But Jal Sotunga Pravah could be something else than we, what we imagine, piped water. Which was never there in the villages. Even now, <laughs> half the villages don't have it, more than half. And then certainly was a novelty. You know, there's this Akbar Ilahabadi uh, share about this. Half a parna pada hai type ka, pani pina pada hai pipe ka. Kya? <laughs> so it's happening around this time. Pipe water, introduction to pipe water. These are all shahri chonchale. But I, I also yeah. felt this thing about the, the word shahri, and I felt that part of its strength as being slightly, you know, that kind of wry yeah. uh, irony mm. that's meant behind this was to do with the fact that it was an adjective. So I struggled ah, for an adjective. And ah. I came up with this, uh, which I'm not particularly, I, it sort of captures what I wanted, not quite. Uh, so I say, it lies beyond the reach of municipal lighting, municipal road sprinklers, and the piped municipal water supply. Yeah, yeah. that civic part is important. Yeah. Ah. Civic amenities part. Yeah. yeah. Any I'll, other? I'll talk about just mm. one or two more, and then I'll... Can we just see if anyone else has a, yeah. a point on that one? Sure. Is it? Yeah. The next problem that I notice is, do char ghar bigale safed poshon ke bhi hai. Now, horrible. one translation says, <laughs> down and out white collar workers. The other says, Depra the depraved rich. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You know, bigale is that kind of word, and here we don't have the Urdu Hindi problem. Right. Urdu could not be any different. Bigale is a faith posh. They are in straitened circumstances, as I read it. They once might have had houses in the center of the town, in posher places, but now because their fortunes have fallen, therefore they have to move out to these outlying areas. That's how I read it. But I'll be very interested to see how others read it. I said, um, so we're, we're not do, looking at the previous sentence with the sweet makers and so forth, right? No, we, 
Yeah, of course. You know, दुकान छोड़ के कहाँ जाएंगे? But you want, on the focus of this sentence, I said uh, one may also find the residence of an occasional white collar worker down on his luck, exiled from the city proper by his impoverished state. White collar worker is such a deeply Western phrase. Yeah. Professional. Professionals? I said formerly well to do. I don't know. I don't know. Safed Posh, Safed Posh also implies that their poverty is stuck in Safed clothes. They are keeping up appearances mm -hmm. as best they can. Because Safed and Nila is not the difference. So can we, blue and white, is it a class thing that we should be bringing? Middle class? Ruined middle class? Because Bigra also implies vice, not just economic. Right? They've done something. They've gambled away their money. To me, yeah, I think, don't you think ruined is a bit strong? Bigra? Ruined, ruined <laughs> transfers the blame to fate. Yeah. Yeah. Bigra is not the same. They don't have to be bigger. I put unemployed here, but I was thinking more when you read the thing. I feel that it's, to me, it's something which is temporary. It could be restored. Their wealth could be, you know, this is why I say down on their luck, because the sense that it's... I wonder yeah. if we can connect their bigla fun with the second sentence. Uske bahar ki bhumi unke manuranjan aur vinod ki jagah. And then the context will completely. It's, yeah, yeah. it's a different kind of. Life. So they've gone out to have. They've gone out to have fun. Yes. Yeah. You're going to end up with a very hot Racy. kind of novel here. <laughs> you know, again, again, one thing, one thing that I'd like to say is. Uh, as the novel progresses, that is not borne out. Hmm. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. I mean, there's nobody who's opted to live uh, in the suburbs, as it were. No. no. They all live in the heart of the town. But if it were Sevasadan, right? Sevasadan, hmm. they basically move the quotas to the Sheher ki bahar ki The quotas will go first and the Safed push after. <laughs> 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 you know, you're right. But that's, see, that's the difference. That was 1917, yeah. this is 27, yeah. so yeah. this is... It's not 27, it's oh, 25. 25, still. Yeah. You know, Snehal, you're perfectly right. The topography of Banaras in Seva Southern is far clearer right. than in this novel. Yeah. Because that's an issue in the novel. Whether to move the prostitutes out of the city from Chalk and uh, right. Dalmandi. Yeah, so... <clears throat> And you know, bigger than Safed Posh and then Hina Vastha. Same pen cannot write both. <laughs> I have a deep suspicion about the Premchand text. I will say one more thing and then I will say the second paragraph. I will say, Daiv ne kadachit bheek maangne ke hi ke liye banaya tha. Daiv, I would like to investigate him. <laughs> I don't know what. Data, on the other hand, two lines yeah, later, yeah, is perfect. <laughs> Data is perfect. Data you, is. Keep that in English. There's great cultural resonance in it for anybody who gives alms. Philanthropist? No, no, that's too big. Data <laughs> is. No, yeah. Yeah. Data, I don't know. What have they done? What have the two translators done? Benefactor. Benefactor. Oh, my benefactor. Benefactor and. Oh, my benefactor. Oh, my benefactor. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, uh, that's right. I mean, but data is the simplicity and the shortness of the word. And also the many compounds in which it occurs, Annadata, Bhagyadata, and so on. Yeah. yeah, but how do we translate it in English? Yes. <laughs> You're asking me? Yes. I haven't done this. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you put? Philanthropist. Any other suggestions on this? I, I Everybody else has benefactor? No, no variations? I didn't have that. Generous one. Yes. Sir, something, something. I mean, the idea is data is also linked to giving. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the implication is... It's a charitable one? <laughs> <laughs> I went through more variations on this, than, and I'm still in mid-course of variations. But, they, but I just said, kind sir, in the mm -hmm. end. Huh? Because, went, kind sir. Yeah. yeah. Because I wanted it to be something which kind sounded... Kind sir is very automatic in, in English. Yeah. And For I wanted something giving. vocative, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And another cultural thing here is kalyan, not kalyan. Huh. Mm -hmm. It's very appropriate. He will not say kalyan. He will say kalyan. It's not even Hindi or Urdu. Mm -hmm. It's just Hindi. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how this will come across differently in translation. 
One last point that I wish to make about this. The Hava Gadi has, the Hava Gadi has provided a lot of fun to the two translators. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish, I wish, I knew exactly what it was. I don't. Oh, you don't? I don't. I've never had one. Should we send him back? <laughs> <laughs> I've never had one. No, no. But the, the idea is of a progression of three types of vehicles. Huh. It's getting grander carriage. and grander, right? right? It's the hor horseless carriage, right? So. Yeah, they're all horse carriages. No, no, but the Hava Gadi is a horseless carriage. Horseless carriage, why? Because there's no horse in front, it's just Hava in front. Right? It's a horseless carriage. No, right? Hava Gadi is not driven by Hava. Hava Gadi. But there's no, there's Hava where the horse should be. You the book is never that. This sounds like Garam Hava to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's perfectly reasonable. <laughs> I I thought I don't know. I just feel that they're all they're all horse drawn, but they're yeah. different yeah. Uh, mm. status. You know, of a different status because it guy's very clear, right? That's a kind of a very simple cart. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And then you've got something slightly better than that, and then something even grander than that. Yeah. And I thought I'd found something. I forget which dictionary. Yeah, Manju, Manju Jan says Victoria. Yeah. 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 Just a fancy I don't know enough really about horse-drawn carriages to know. <laughs> you know I mean, I know more about well. Queen Victoria than about this Did Victoria. But what, what is it? I have no idea. The Victoria is a kind of yeah. But it was uh, yeah. I, I just, I just, I thought it was just wonderful to end up with this expression in English: "Victorias yeah. don't listen to anything," I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> including Queen Victoria. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a wonderful sort of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> improving the text. But it's only English. <laughs> Isn't Havagari also related to the speed? Oh, it goes really fast. Yeah. As speed as that air. that may and not be, speed. may or may I don't think so. Uh, this is like Chetak. Palgaya Hava se palata. Chetak moving as fast as Hava. Yeah. But I think Hava Gadi is just Gadi me bat ke Amir Lok Sham ko Hava khane jati thi. I thought that it was an ordinary thing. Absolutely. That's, the, that's my understanding of Hava Gadi. A kind of a luxury vehicle for the rich in which they went out for a drive in the evening. But, but from, the, from the point of view of the narrative, the important thing is the, the, the register difference. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's exactly. Rather than the actual design of them. I mean, it's yeah. because he, he realizes that you know, uh, anything that's horse drawn at all is worth chasing, but that after a certain level, it's diminishing returns because those people, the rich, never actually give you anything. Absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. So we've, that's got, the we've, we've got to have the, the levels of the. Yep. Yep. I noticed that in the, in the sentence just before that, there is a, some kind of a contrast drawn between a buggy huh. and a hava guy. Yeah. Huh. So are buggies always closed? They might also be open, right? And, and if that is the case, then what Shilpa says, in terms of hava se baat karti gari. Huh. 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 That's what, that, uh, that, yeah. That, that, that yeah. may be. It's very nice idea. Yeah. You know, hava se baat karti gari came up. And uh, is that the reason why he's not chasing them? He has to grow wings for the buggies, right? His feet have to grow wings to chase the buggies. But his feet are like that. His feet are like that. But it's a very graded kind of three-vehicle arrangement. And who will give and who will not give. And I think this, all the suggestions seem very plausible to me. But only one can be right, only one can be what Premchand had in mind. And I don't know how to arrive at that. Would there have been motor cars in Banaras in the 20s? But mot motor gadi was never called hava gadi. Mm -hmm. Pleasure car, or some, something you can <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah. Racy, racy version of the story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Sports car. Race car. <laughs> something, yeah. Touring car, something this, this I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's. I think I, I can't remember now because I was using a number of different dictionaries, but I thought I found something for Hawagari that it oh, was actually a, a four wheeled carriage as opposed to a two wheeled trap. Uh huh, right, right. Huh, are you up bus here? Wow. It's well, more like I've completely forgotten my Hindi. I have no, it's more likely to be in Shabd Saga than yeah. that, I think. Uh -huh. I can get my laptop. Uh -huh. I can read. 
You know, one difference between this kind of a gathering here and in India is, in India, people would insist that they know, <laughs> and not consult a dictionary. <laughs> we, would, we would never insist that. Because <laughs> <laughs> our nose might be cut. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not judging the quality. What I'm saying uh, about the, well, about whether it's Plimpton's own pen or not translate. is <laughs> that there is no linguistic consistency or integrity of a creative writer even on this one page. It could not all be from the same pen in that sense. And in Havagali, there's no problem. That's obviously Premchand. But in other examples that we talked about, what I'm saying is, and there is another bit of evidence, biographical evidence. Premchand would not waste his time beyond the first few years of learning Hindi to translate his own work. He'd rather write new works. Right. And therefore, he, he outsourced yeah. translation of his works to at least two persons whose names we find. Munshi Iqbal Verma Sahar. Sahar is his takhallus and I forget the other name, who are unknown to literary distinction, but Premchand trusted them enough to have them, to, to hire them for money to translate his own Hindi works into English, uh, sorry, uh, Urdu works into Hindi. And this is recorded in some cases, not in this case. So this is going on, but this is, I mean, not even deliberately hushed up, I don't think. It's just the evidence has not been recovered, and nobody has looked hard for it. The last thing, the last thing that I wish to say, and after that I'll quit this. Anubhav ne use shiksha di thi. I love this again. Anubhav ne use shiksha di thi is back translation from English. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't belong to either Hindi or Urdu. <laughs> yeah. And how? <laughs> this is the la 11th Achha. and last volume of Achha. Hindi Shabd Sagar, and I have to report the delightful fact that the first word in this volume and the last word in this volume are both English words. It, it's skunk se lekar whale tak. Skunk whale is That's a huh. whale to you. <laughs> Isn't that great? The last word in Hindi. <laughs> whale. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it in the class? Um, no, that's funny. We are four years old. Have you known more things in the first part? Because I have other things in the first part. Yeah, yeah, please, please. And so many others. Yeah. Harish, I'm, uh, I'm quite upset with you for pull, pulling the rug out from under so many of my bright ideas here. Because um, I, hope, I hope I've done the same to some others as well. Yeah, because <laughs> where is the... Uh, when he says... Um, uh, Bharat Varshme. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's, if, if it's just a translation from Urdu, then there's no point in saying this. But if it's him using that word himself, it seems to me that there's a kind of ironic play on the register. So, and I felt that it's not enough just to say India. I, I, I couldn't figure out what to do. In the end, I ended up saying that I wanted to kind of have some kind of way of mm. focusing on it. And I can't even find it in my place now. Um, in, I said, in our land of India, to make it a little bit more self-conscious as a usage than just, than, it just, it's more than just Bharat. How many of you have uh, attempted something similar? Because, you know, I went. Rupert's point is absolutely correct. Bharat Vashme is adding something to the rhetoric here. It's not necessary. I mean, if it were literal, it will sound like Salman Rushdie, <laughs> native informancy. But he's not saying it happens in India, and you may not know about it. He is drawing attention, ironically, to something. Yeah, bilkul sahi hai. But did anyone add value to this in translation? I did in yeah. the land of the once great king Bharat. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's the best that I could do for part of the version. That context that there are blind people with silly names, right? That sort of. Quality. You know, I now that attention has been drawn to this, I did not, I did not notice that particularly. Uh, I would stop short. Uh, I would go part of the way with this and say, in this land of ours, 
not name India, uh -huh. in this land of ours, or if, if you like, in this great land of ours, mm -hmm. which will have the same rhetorical effect. But India, India Bharatvarsh itself is ironic. Mm. If we spell it out, then we don't need to name it. Okay. But doesn't this all bring up the issue, and tell me if you don't want to talk about it, this, the whole question of translating up? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, that, that's, that's got to be an issue in translation, right? Are you going to? Do you mean quality, or do you mean quantity of words? Well, I don't mean just quantity of words. I mean. I mean, saying I more than was said. Saying more than was said, yes. Either yeah. by way of fancy footnote or embroidery, just embellishment, yeah. rhetorical embellishment. Not even what? embellishment, explanation. Yeah. And I, to I ensure mean, understanding. Mm -hmm. Embellishment not, is the next step up. It, but in this case, it's not. It's a substitution. Yeah. yeah. Right? It's a one to one substitution. I mean, but this, I'm not saying mine was successful, but what I was trying to do was a substitution. Right. That it wasn't adding anything. I felt that it was there. It was it was there in the, the pregnant use of that word, and that all I was doing was spelling but it out. You were ex spelling it out exactly. Yeah, yeah. Spelling it out in translation studies for what it's worth, they've coined a word for it. It's called explicitation. Oh. It's a very useful word. It's a horrible word. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound like English. It makes me want to. It doesn't out sound like English. <laughs> but but it's one of those words that belongs to theory. Not to Sounds conversation. like it needs to be problematized. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Explicitation. And I think it Actually, conveys... It sounds like a Bushism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, uh, forgive me, but it sounds like transportation for transport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there's a difference between metonymy and hyperbole. Right? Yeah. There's a difference between something that's close and next to as opposed to bigger and brighter than. So yeah, it's not embroidering. Right. It's not heightening. It is just explaining what the mere substitution will not explain. Making explicit, not even explaining. I mean, what it reminds me of is Hamara Hindustan. I mean, the way people say Hamara Hindustan. Yeah. Or, or something like Hamari Yahan. Hamari Yahan. Right. This is the yes. Ah, Gujarati. I, I think I, I think I, I'm leaning towards what Ruth is saying. Mm -hmm. I think I really Undercurrent of sarcasm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that sarcasm can be read both ways. You know, when I say, Yera Bharat Maha, Yere Mahan Bharat Me, and it can imply both the things. Those who understand it can actually use the sarcasm to be mind actually just go with the right line of India. You know, I'd go with that, but not too far. I'll tell you where I'll stop, and then I may have to backtrack. Bilkul sahi hai, surdas unka bana banaya naam hai, bheeg mangna unka bana banaya kaam hai, gun sobhavi jagat prasit hai. But then, at that point, it begins to turn. Kaane bajane mein vishesh ruchi tab tak tik hai. Hirday mein vishesh anurag, how can that be ironical? And adhyatma aur bhakti mein vishesh prem, unke sobhavik lakshan. And then he clinches it most unironically, affirmatively, by his drishti band or under the drishti kuli. What could be higher praise? But don't you feel that all those statements are loaded with sarcasm? The last few sentences, even the last few sentences. That very sentence, "Gaane bajane mein vishesh ruchi." Oh, I see. Is does not imply their special interest in musicality. Right, right, right. It implies as a trade. Yeah, right. But right. beyond that? <laughs> yeah, we'll have to tell you. I'm just curious for that sentence, which of the two, you know, in the two translations do you prefer? And I'm just wondering, for that sentence that you just pointed out, Bharat Varshme and the Adhino Ke Le Na, you know, I think it begins one way, and then it turns round. The way Prem Chand begins. Therefore, looking back, backtracking, we don't have to read it too ironically. Slightly mm -hmm. ironically, mm -hmm. but not too ironically. Because then we'll never get to Vajidrishti and Antradrishti. And within a couple of lines. So, in the beginning, yes, given our 2011 mental <laughs> makeup, 
we are inclined to read it ironically. And I think we have to contain ourselves before we go too far, because Premchan pulls us back. Vishesh Anurag is whatever it was in Urdu. And I don't know why his Drishti, Antar Drishti, Bhakti, where does that, how does, mm. is that accommodated in Urdu? Mm. I'd have loved to have an Urdu version here. Yeah. All this is deep Hindu, yeah. in the best sense, perhaps. Named after a poet, <laughs> no, it's, uh, and as uh, Rupert was saying earlier in the morning, Suldas may not have been the first blind person to have some of these attributes. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's crazy to uh, allege that it was. I mean, especially to go to the point of making a footnote of it. Yeah. Ah, I know, and we argued about it this morning. Yeah. <laughs> so let's have the argument in public. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I said to uh, Rupert was, yes, I'm willing to grant that historically there were blind people in India before the poet sold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also willing to grant the fact that some of them may have had some of the same qualities or virtues constrained by the lack of options, whatever. But we don't know their names. Mm -hmm. The first name that we know, and it may not even be his given name, it may be imposed on him ironically, Surjadas, Surdas, for a blind man, begins with the poet. There's no historical being before that that we can verify and identify. So let's begin with him then. There's a footnote. There's a footnote in one of the translations. Right. So yeah. What did you think of that? Is that a good way to do it? I, I, tend to I think it's better than not having a footnote. Itself, yeah. I think it's better than not having a footnote because this name will run with us throughout. But the I think he's the hero. I think they footnoted the wrong point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, po the, the, the point that needs to be footnoted is that that, that Suldas is itself a very ironic name for a blind person. Mm -hmm. Not that there was a historic person who to whom this may or may not be dated, which we can't tell anyway. No, I am not not Because of that stereotype. Yes. Yeah. And, and in that connection, it's all very serious stuff. And hmm. I, I don't see it as being very uh, sarcastic, at least in that piece of the syntax. Shall we overrule them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think, you know, there are obviously two ways of looking at it. And I have done the dirty thing by ascribing this to deeply rooted cultural differences, <laughs> <laughs> ascribable to where we come from. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. Um, it seems to me really interesting that we're having this fairly extended discussion about, you know, how it's appropriate to note cultural difference. Yeah. And yet, when it comes to time-bound difference, it's so simple for us. And I wonder if that's maybe that we're elevating cultural difference too much above um, anachronism. You know, there are things in this text which we would never think were necessary to footnote, just so we would know exactly what a Victoria is or exactly what water sprinkling on the, yeah. on the ground is. And yet, mm -hmm. when it comes to surdas, we feel that that's so much more loaded. And I don't know if people around the table feel that, yes, we have to respect that weight, or, or maybe we can let it be a little lighter. Mm -hmm. We could call him Milton. Would that make the difference better? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do with Chamar? It's close yeah. as I can come Chamar, to a British English. Would you leave? Where the word Chamar comes? Where the word Chamar comes? wasn't a devotee. The best way, you know, my exactly, yeah, yeah, we'll call it Shamar a Shamar. Yeah. Yeah. Not even an untouchable? What I did. Untouchable? Untouchable is the same thing. If Premchand says, 
तो ठीक था Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, so this Surdas. This Surdas has never been a leather worker in the literal term. Yeah. He only belongs to that caste. Yeah. So I said. Yes, uh, sir. <laughs> um, I just want to go back to the sarcasm or lack thereof issue and uh, point out that I think you've got enough. Actually, I think you have both. I think you have a tension between outer and inner um, because you have the part first being a, sort of the outer perspective, and then you have the, the blind the blind poet sort of um, being becoming respectful. Hmm. Um, hmm. So, so I think you have both going on. It kind of mirrors to it, to to a certain extent what you have earlier in the paragraph yep. between the inner and outer sort of the topography or the geography of the of the city as well. So, yeah, it's my, it's my thought that you've got both. You're starting out with the sarcastic yeah. part of yeah. and ending up with a respectful thing about the interior uh, life of the of Are you suggesting, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, uh, that's, that's fascinating. Are you suggesting, if I understand you right, that the deepening of the regard is underlined by the fact that the discourse begins with what may at first sight look like irony. And therefore, the reversal has more impact. Yes. I think that's, uh, mm. that's then it will work even better. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Another, another problem in the last line is Mark Poos, Jade Baisak, very emotive terms, cultural terms. In Prem time in 1927, everyone would know when they occur. Now I'm not so sure. <laughs> no, it's, uh, so I don't know. There's a problem with so much narrative in Bengali, in all the Indian languages. And it depends, a lot of it depends on if you're writing for an Indian readership or a world readership, right? Then there was no world readership, thank God. No, no, but I mean, yeah. in this, the trans, for the translator, there is. Translation. Oh, translation. You know, no, I don't think so. No longer. There are how how there many are... Anglophone Indians know Mark Poos? The kind of people who read these translations. Mm -hmm. How many will know Mark Poos and Jade Bessa? Now, everything is one. Now, the knowledge has gone. Yes. I have a thought about this. Uh, talking about this word, Safed Bosch. Mm. When I read this word, first, the first time I read it, the first thing that came to my mind is Kudawa. That's what that means. So, I mean, that, that's the, I mean, this thing about the middle class is really interesting, but the first thing that I thought of was Alakabanda, Kudawa. I mean, that's the way I've always heard it used in Urdu. And so... Safed Bosch. Safed Bosch. Almost, uh, almost Sufi? Yeah, Sufi much. Yeah, 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 right. Okay. So, you have this kind of, I mean, here we're talking about like this this group of middle class people living in this settlement, and then there's kind of like this Chamar also living there. And that, anyway, I, I don't know. I don't know what other people in the room think, but I don't know. I think that this ne, bus thing he's talking about is. Usko uh, aap bigle kyun keh rahe? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, Hana? that's really interesting. But there's yeah. also an interesting tie. I mean, and he's getting into this here, but there's an interesting tie between sort of blindness and religious devotion. So in Urdu and in some regions, the blind are referred to as hafiz, which is a title uh, which refers to someone who's memorized the Quran. Yeah, yeah. And so people call the blind hafiz sahab, right? So. Oh, that's even better because they have right. to memorize because they can't read. Right. Yeah. And so, but but there or peer, right? Some people call it. I mean, you hear this all the time. So this kind of tying of hmm. blindness to devotion and this idea of being kind of Sufi manish, I think, is really what's coming out here, rather than this notion of class, uh, white collar which I mean, I, I don't know. I, my first, when, I, when I read the line, that's the first thing that I thought was Kudawala. If Surdas were a Safed Posh, I'd take all of that. Yeah. But the Safed Posh and Surdas are different people. Do you know what Surdas They're not even the same segment. No, no, but I'm, right. Inhabiting the same space, yeah. similar space, but not even the, not same class, same segment, same category, no. 
they just follow in succession in descriptive sentences, just that. Yeah, I know that, but we're, I mean, we're not talking about Surdas, we're talking about this blind child yeah, who's yeah, living. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then right. is his name. No, the, the other point is, you know, if you can one evoke, that's the interesting point. Are Hindi and Urdu close enough? Are Hindus and Muslims and Banaras close enough for us to be able to exploit the connotations of both the poet Surdas and the Hafiz? I doubt it. But I don't think that's what I'm saying. What I'm hmm. saying is that the laqab of a blind person is tied to this kind of notion of religious devotion. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have this idea of Safed Boshi coming into the story, and I think that it's less tied to a kind of class distinct distinction than to a community of religious mendicants. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying much more than that. That's all I'm trying to get at. I want to refute your previous point. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a slow worker. <laughs> but about this, the, I think there is a distinction between an Indian readership and the world readership. In the um, Manju Jain hmm. translation, she has this sentence about six lines in, eight lines in. She says, there are small shops of halwais and baniyas on the roadside, <laughs> behind which live several ikkawalas, carters, cowherds, and laborers. Hmm. There are three terms in that which people outside India would not understand. Hmm. And people inside India, everybody would understand. So we surely have two different readerships. You want me to refute that immediately? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will, I will. But Ika is kept in the other translation as well. <laughs> yeah. Let me, that doesn't, that doesn't help. You know, you know, I think, I think, <laughs> one, of the, one of the expectations of translating from any Indian language into English, even for an Indian readership, is that the text then will travel beyond that particular region. Hmm. where the original language is spoken. Right. Uh, how many Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam speakers will know Halwai, Kawala, and Tangawala, and so on? Oh, a lot, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> White Tiger is written by Ariga. Central characters. But then he knows only, <laughs> <laughs> only <laughs> Halwai. Only <laughs> Halwai. At least he knows Halwai. And he, he writes <laughs> and he writes exclusively for foreign readers. <laughs> 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 so what does that prove? <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I, I think people South South Indians know a lot more about North India yeah. through yeah. film yeah. culture than North Indians know about South India or that North Indians know South Indians know about them. <laughs> it's like, but, I mean, the difference between is, Canada and the United States, you know? But they will, uh, they will certainly know what a banya is, right? <laughs> yeah, they'll know a banya. They very possibly know what Hawaii Kibukan is. I yeah. mean, the other thing that's interesting <laughs> about this sentence is that um, Gwal, Gwal, uh, Gwal, Gwali, Gwali, huh? is translated as cowherd. Huh. Whereas, I mean, what you said about Jamar is that he's not actually a leather worker. No. It's a question of caste, right? And it's a confusion of caste and occupation. Hmm. Because hmm. If, you see, if you see the words cowherds and laborers, it brings to mind pictures of herds of cows wandering <laughs> in this part of the city, right? And they're not necessarily doing that at all. It's not, it's not the city. It's not Banaras. It's, it's Pandipur. Yeah, but we don't know that he's literate. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? I mean, if a Jamar is not a leather worker, but a beggar, then a, a Gwal may be doing anything. No, no, no. I, th I think there's a slight difference in my mind. He cannot be a leather worker unless there's very specialist training given to him because he's handicapped, visually handicapped. <laughs> the other thing about they Gwali train the cows. So no, so no. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about Gwali is, you know, the land which belongs to Surdas technically yeah. and legally, yeah. which the cigarette company is, uh, the own John Sevak is going to huh. buy. That is actually a charaga. That is common pasture. Okay. So, mm -hmm. okay. that, brings, that makes me think of an important question. How important is it to think of the readership when you're translating the text? Vital. Vital. People pretend that they do it <laughs> art for art's sake, swante sukhai. But unless you have a readership, you wouldn't know in which register to translate, what strategies to adopt, how you would be able to write a sentence. An original writer, a poet, can claim to do that. I don't even believe him, but a translator cannot do that. Then most translations of Hindi yeah. fiction are for yeah. Anglophone Indian audiences, right? Yeah. They're not for the West. I mean, yeah. these things don't sell in the West. 
maybe there's an occasional library that buys them. But so it's not like you feel that all translations into English are for an Indian readership? I don't know about all, but I can't think of anybody with the global reputation that would earn a Western audience. Not even Ramanujan? I think he's a special. Uh, he's a special case. Mm. Hindi. I don't know of anybody of that stature. He has an, he has an independent reputation as a poet, um, and his translations are themselves winning prizes, right? So it's it's a separate kind of category. I don't know of a, like a Hindi novel that sold well in translation in. You know, once I asked in the West, does anybody know yeah. of one that sold well? I mean, my translation did terribly in the U.S. sales. I asked the CEO CEO of Penguin India some years back, I said, uh, you call Penguin. There's a Penguin in England, there's a Penguin in America, you are the same, are you? So I, he said, what are you getting at? So I said, suppose you publish 2,000 copies of a book under the Penguin India imprint. How many are picked up by Penguin UK and Penguin USA? He said, six if we are lucky. <laughs> That's, probably That's what he said. <laughs> Six, if we are lucky. It's their fault for taking as their symbol a bird that doesn't fly. <laughs> <laughs> I said, didn't they borrow that from England? <laughs> <laughs> you are to blame. <laughs> <laughs> but just to pick up on this for a yeah. So back to the word chamar. If we're worried about, or if we're concerned with our audience, our intended audience, my guess is, and we're doing this in 2010, 2011, we won't use the term Chamar, we use the term Dalit, because that has, that has superseded all the other Resonance. Resonance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very good you know. point. Mm -hmm. So you know, we wouldn't have this problem. But it sounds anachronistic, right? Maybe. I mean, but I to completely take your point. I think you're right. That is the, because it's, the untouchability has been through so many different, um, you know, uh, what's the word? Euph euphemisms, right? Yes. And they've all, they all wear out after a time yes. because they sound just as damning as the previous one did mm -hmm. after a time. You, know. you mean that it would also go? Yeah, absolutely. Because what, what, which one has lasted more than, you know, it's scheduled, scheduled, scheduled classes? I can't say the word. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. Decide no, I'm going to make it from the CA. SC. You're too Yes. Last year we had a, a yeah. graduate seminar here um, taught by Martha Sel, Dr. Martha Selby, uh, about translation and translation theory. And one of the class sessions, that, in, in one of the class sessions, we we're talking about the role of the translator, the responsibility of the translator, and the relationship between the translator and the translator's audience. And one of the things that came onto the table was um, the idea that actually, uh, perhaps the role of the translator is not to make the text, um, is not to domesticate the text in the uh, so-called target language. That maybe at times the role of the translator is to challenge the reader uh, with a word like chamar, uh, to um, struggle to understand something that, that is not domestic, is something that is not uh, immediately accessible if you're not familiar with South Asia and its context. You're right. So yeah. I wonder sometimes if we, I mean, I think it's important to make things readable and accessible, but at the same time, I wonder if we should be thinking also about our, uh, if, 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 we t if we think of ourselves as translators, as representatives of this text in some way, right? No, but the that's one of the big the, the ahead, demand is always when you do words like that, editors demand a glossary, which then just does the same thing that the translation would do to domesticate, right? So it's not like there'll be an appendix which indicates it's the anthropology of Chamars in North India or something <laughs> like that, right? It'll just be a, a, a line in the back that says Chamar colon leather worker cast, something like that. Yeah. And you have to then infer the rest anyway. So mm -hmm. it does seem like there's a kind of philosophical question that's different than the actual publishing industry question. And um, somewhere in between, those lines get kind of really fuzzy and blurry. Um, yep. I think that, that both of these points are sort of well taken in today. Physically in between them, I also want to take a middle ground. One of the things that um, I learned in, a, in another previous translation seminar was that sometimes actually an audience can take pleasure you know, out of a text which retains a little bit of a foreign flavor, that the same person who is already going to pursue a text in translation from a culture with which they might not be familiar might want a little bit of, of masala in that. And
and, and that we should retain it not only for a philosophical reason, but for a sort of a marketability reason, that, that it, it gives a, an authenticity to And in that domestication, in translation debates, the other side to that, the other pole is foreignization. Or exoticization. Exoticization. Yeah. And this debate goes not only back to Lawrence Venuti's recent work, he's been big on it, but to Schleiermacher. It's an old debate. It comes up under different names. Uh, and there is no solution to it. One has to go one way or the other. And the only thing about resistant translation is called a rough translation. It's politically very correct. But if it becomes a little too resistant, the reader puts down the book and never comes back to it. <laughs> the reader then begins to resist the translation. So th that's the risk to run. Uh, if also, if you're taking progressive, I'm sorry to keep jumping in. If you take progressive writing and you think about how its whole mandate is to recreate an atmosphere and an environment and to, and to paint a picture of the world as it is. And people, you're going to run into this big problem of which ones do you leave and which ones do you translate, and how much do you translate them. And you're just, there's, there's going to be no end to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the number of adjectives he uses. You know, it's just. Yeah. Aage padhe, Tulsi Das ki or? Sur Das se Tulsi Das. Isme bahut abhi aur padha hai, lekin kya hoga aage? Yeah, 